This is Real Estate Rookie episode 251. Every recession going back to like the, the 60s, right? Most of them lasted just under, on average, just under 12 months, right? So it's like, can you buy this property? And even if it maybe isn't a, a home run over those first 12 months while all, there's all this economic uncertainty, what happens in year two and in year five and in year 10 as you own the short-term rental? And if you kind of check those boxes that we talked about, where you're hitting the, the location, you're hitting the value, you're hitting the amenities, more likely than not, that listing is going to continue to do well. So there will probably be some uncertainty in the short term, but I think as real estate investors, we have to roll with those punches um, and remember that we're really investing for that long-term appreciation and cash flow as well. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And I want to start today's episode by shouting out someone by the username of E Shazam. Uh, Shazam looked to say five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It says, all of these real life stories are so inspiring. I love knowing all of these people jumped in without being experts. They're learning along the way and they exemplify that there are many ways to approach real estate investing. The guests aren't always necessarily practice interviewees, but Ashley and Tony do an amazing job keeping the podcast flowing and interesting. And you guys are just adorable personalities too. Shazam, I appreciate that. I think that might be the first time as an adult I've been called adorable, but I am here for it. I'm, I'm all about it. Tony, I, every time I meet somebody, that's usually, you know, the number one thing they say about you. It, it, oh, he's just so adorable. It's, <laughs> it, what's his skincare routine? He's so yeah, adorable. Skin, skincare I get all the time, but the adorable is a new one. But I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay yeah, with I'll that. take that any day. I've been called worse. <laughs> So, Tony, I'm super excited because today we are starting a new series in the Real Estate Rookie of podcast episodes. We are doing a 90-day mentee group, and we have three people we have chosen where we are going to stick with them for 90 days and help them in any way that we can to reach their real estate investing goals. Yeah, it's super exciting. You know, we, we've got such an engaged and amazing rookie audience. And, you know, us along with the production team, we thought like, how can we provide more value to folks in our audience? And we thought, man, what, what cooler way than bringing some folks who are rookies onto the podcast, following along with them for 90 days, Ash and I giving as much value to them as we can. And then the rest of our rookie audience getting to listen along and hopefully pick up some cool things along the way. So you guys are going to meet um, three amazing people uh, on the podcast. So first up, you're going to meet Brandon Diorio. He is from Minnesota. Then we're going to bring on Lawrence Briggs from Texas. And we're going to finish off with Melanie Wilmisher from Colorado. And each one of them is in a slightly different position, slightly different starting point, slightly different goals. And uh, Ash and I are going to do our best to kind of break down what they're working on and give them some insights and advice on how to keep moving towards those goals. And I already know that we're going to learn a ton from them too, which I'm super excited about. That's one of the best things about being the host is we get to learn from everybody else uh, firsthand too. So um, today we're just going to talk about kind of goal setting. Um, we're going to assign some homework and give everyone their mins, the most important next step. Um, and kind of plan out what we're going to be doing with them over the next 90 days. So today's just the the starting point. And then um, we're going to be doing follow-up episodes to see what the, the journey is like and helping them get those deals. Yeah. And really what we want you guys to do as you're listening is to challenge yourself to follow along. And, and if your goals are similar to what Lawrence and Brandon and uh, Melanie are all working towards, see if you can challenge yourself to do the same things we're talking about these episodes. And then maybe by the next uh, the 90 days or so, you have your own goal achieved just by listening to, to what we have here. So that's our challenge to you guys is, is to follow along and do it, do it at home as well. Brandon, welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. You're the first mentee up. And as a quick intro for our rookie audience, I just want to share a quick few things about you so folks can get to know you a little bit better. Number one is that you're an HVAC contractor look, looking to get that first deal done. Uh, number two, your family's in commercial real estate, but you are actually interested in residential. And number three, you enjoy paintballing, man. So uh, anything else outside of those three points you want to share with the rookie listeners? Uh, no, that sums me up pretty good. Work quite a bit when it's hot and cold now like it is. Um, actually in my truck in between calls. 
um, pushed my lunch to 2 p.m. Dude, if, if if that isn't the sign of a rookie investor, I don't know what is, man. You're you're out there working on your lunch break, hopping on this podcast episode. And before we started recording, you told me how cold it was where you were. Just like, give us a sense of how frigid it is out there. You said it was like in the single digits. Yeah, single digits overnight. I mean, right now, the sun's still pretty strong. It's 22 degrees. but So I don't have my truck running, so... It's not too bad, but overnights are pretty bad walking my dog who woke me up at three last night to go out. And- Brandon, I have to ask, what is your strategy for when you have to break that bad news to someone that they need that a new HVAC system put in? Uh, it's I never don't really have a strategy that much because it's always, I mean, with how expensive furnaces have gotten, it's hard unless it's truly unsafe. That's about the only time I really try to emphasize getting a new one. Uh, but I mean, you get to 20 year old furnaces that need fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars worth of work, or then you try to educate them that's just not worth it, like an old car with bad tires, brakes, and weird engine tick. So you don't get a lot of customers that would like cry like me because they have to spend a lot of money and have to consult them. <laughs> <laughs> it's never usually like the total amount, but it's a uh, red tag when furnaces are just putting off too much carbon monoxide and you have to shut off their gas. That's the one that oh, yeah. gets to people. We are super excited to have you on over the next 90 days with us. Uh, can you maybe tell everyone a little bit about what you have going on in real estate investing now? Um, so nothing active right now. I'm trying to track down a few deals. Um, just actually missed out on one today because it was a pre-foreclosure. Um, that it was the last day of the rescission period, I believe it was. Um, we're just going to come up with the money fast enough. It was only about a two-week heads up from walking through it to when that was running up, just trying to identify a house for either long-term or a house hack for myself. And what market are you currently looking in? Uh, About 40 to 50 minutes uh, west of Minneapolis, where I'm currently living, so I want to stay somewhat close. And when did you kind of start looking for deals? What was like your, when you decided like, I'm taking action, I want to start putting offers in, I want to start looking, I want to do this. How long have you kind of been in this period of time? Um, about a year ago, I spent two months pretty heavily trying to buy something, but was never even close with how the market was. Basically, full-heartedly kind of gave up offering and looking and stuff like that and just focused more on reading the books and learning what I could. And now that stuff's finally slowed down, trying to finally make it happen. Now that the market has changed, do you what do you think is your biggest obstacle, your biggest hurdle, the thing that you need help with right now? My biggest thing I'd need help with is just knowing that I'm looking at numbers right, just uh, using the different programs for estimating rents, um, managing rehab costs and stuff like that. So when we think about your goals, I just want to recap for our, our listeners here. So uh, you've been thinking about doing this for about a year or so, maybe dabbling a little bit. Uh, but the goal for you, Brandon, is that over the next 90 days to get your first uh, property under contract somewhere in and around that that region that you're at in Minnesota. Yeah. Awesome. Now, w- one quick thing, because I, I mentioned this when we first started, you said your, your family's in commercial real estate, but you're choosing to go the residential route. Give us some insight into why you're leaning that way versus the commercial. Um, so right now, leading residential mostly just for the startup cost, um, down payment money with commercials, just much, much more. A mm-hmm. uh, little bit harder to get into. Um, my family's they did a lot of development, but they've kind of moved into residential now more that I've been talking about it and a few opportunities have come that they were able to um, tackle without or that I wasn't able to. Um, so they kind of they're kind of split with a few properties in both now. So when when we think about this goal you have of getting that first uh, residential property under contract in the next 90 days, what what are some challenges that you're anticipating maybe with your market or any other things? Rent control. I know every market's a little bit different. What what are some challenges you feel like you might be facing? Uh, challenges right now are just making the numbers work now with higher interest rates, just trying to find a property that cash flows a little bit just so I can be safe about it or just something that makes sense for moving into for myself and renting out the rooms. Brandon, can we dive into your finances a little bit? As of right now, what is your plan to purchase a property? Have you been pre-approved for a loan? Do you have a down payment saved? Do you have a private money lender? What does your purchasing power kind of look like right now so we can kind of get an idea? I actually did just get re-pre-approved because the other one was a year old uh, today. Um, I do have a down payment saved up, so I could put 20% down of upwards of 440 kind of. I think that math works out there. 
So I do have that set aside waiting to make something happen. Um, ideally, it would be two cheaper properties with the money I've set aside for a down payment. So it seems like you're in a pretty good spot, Brandon. You you have some capital set aside. You have you know the the ability to get approved for a loan. So when you think about the challenges, you said it's really just making the numbers work. I just want to ask you a question. In the last month, how many deals would you say you've analyzed? Uh, last month, kind of last thirty days trailing. Do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd say I looked heavily into about. Only probably about five looked heavily into and kind of 100 foot view on closer to 20. Brandon, do you have a buying criteria, like a buy box as to when you're looking at, you know, the property? It's like, OK, checklist, it matches this, this. Oh, not that. OK, I'm moving on to the next one. Like, how are you doing that kind of overview of the properties and then deciding which one you're actually doing that deep analysis on? Um, that could be kind of where I hang myself up as I don't have a hundred percent buy box or anything narrowed down. The biggest thing, so for a house hack, ideally I would like something with a master bedroom, um, which in the price point that I'm looking, there just hasn't been too many because it's older houses that just never had those. And for more long term stuff, I guess my buy box for interest has been if it looks rough, has kind of sparked my interest. Um, scrolling through pictures, I like seeing older furnaces, older ACs, water heaters, stuff that I can very easily take care of uh, and also use as a negotiation for saying that those have to get swapped out and then being able to do them both in a day. But other than that, I haven't really narrowed down too much, kind of more of it's a, an area thing for me at this point. So are you saying that more of it's when you see a property, it's just in your head kind of as you're looking through it? Yeah. Okay. The this makes it easy for us. This is your first homework assignment. So what I want you to do is actually like take the time to write down like some of those things you listed off to me and then think of more, add more things on like, you know, what is your budget for a property? Um, all these different things that you want in a property and just start making a list of that. And then as you're going through and looking at these properties, maybe you'll think of more things like, oh, you know what? This property has this. I think that would be a huge value add. I'm going to add it onto my criteria, my buy box. So every time that you're looking at a property, you're going through the same checklist and that will kind of get rid of the fluff and you won't be wasting time analyzing deals that don't meet what you actually want anyway. So that way you're getting it right off the bat as to looking for those things that are on your list. So you don't spend, you know, more time on it. And then Tony, um, what would be the the second part to that is doing deal analysis, you think? Yeah, I, I think we gotta we gotta ramp up the volume of deals that you're analyzing. Um so you said you, you did about five deals in the last month. I wanna like five, six X that. So if we can get you to a point, Brandon, where you're analyzing at least one deal per day, you know, you get off of work, you're eating dinner, whatever it is, just spend like that 30, 45 minutes analyzing a new deal. And what's going to happen is two things. First, the buy box piece that Ashley talked about, that buy box is going to become clearer for you because as you analyze more deals, you're going to start recognizing trends in certain areas or bedroom sizes or square footages around, okay, these properties tend to do better than these properties. So I'm, I'm going to narrow my buy box down to now just these things. So that's the first thing is your buy box gets tighter just by analyzing more deals. Second, there's a good chance that if you analyze 30 deals this month instead of five compared to last month, one of those 30 might be worth actually submitting an offer on. And I think that's the first hurdle that we have to get you towards is submitting those offers because that once that starts to happen, now we're getting closer to you actually closing on that first deal. Brandon, as you're doing, like, it's so easy for us to say that, but you're going to have to make the time and be intentional about doing that deal analysis and creating that buy box. So, you know, when we're done on this call or, you know, sometime even tonight is time block. Okay. This is the period, you know, this time period, every single day, I'm going to be doing this. Or, you know what, maybe you're just going to batch do it on Sunday evenings. You're going to do, you know, seven different deal analysis. And, you know, even if there's not seven deals that meet your buy box, just grab anything just to practice running the numbers on it too. And just remember too, that even though that's what the asking price is, that doesn't mean what you have to pay for a property. So just decrease the asking price you know, your decrease your offer to to make the deal work, um, and see what that number actually comes to. Um, 
So yeah, I, I want you to kind of do those things and work on it. And you, if you need that accountability, feel free to post into our Slack channel that we have your deal analysis. So if you're using the bigger pockets deal analysis, post those reports. And, um, I might actually harp on you and nag on you if I don't see any activity in there. So (laughs) just to help hold you accountable and just submit them in there. And then too, maybe, you know, we can provide more value to you as to like, look at this thing and, you know, maybe you could change that and just help you kind of fine tune that deal analysis too. All right. Last question for me, Brandon, just so I better understand your situation. Are you currently working with the realtor? Are you, are you searching these deals yourself? What's your deal flow look like? So I'm currently working. My dad's the realtor that I've been working with. Um, I have my license as well, but it's frozen right now. Uh, I've been using kind of his insights on a lot of stuff, which might've been what's been slowing me down as well is I underwrite with an extra percent or two. And then he looks at it and adds a percent or two over what I have. So then stuff just has never worked out. (laughs) Um, So definitely need to kind of narrow it in there. So I feel like we've got a decent game plan for you, but you know, Ashley mentioned the idea of like time blocking and it is difficult to make the time to do these things when you have a full-time job, especially one that's like demanding from a time perspective, from a physicality perspective. So what I really want you to focus on, Brandon, is is why you're starting on this journey. So if you can share with us, why is it so important for you to reach this goal? And what does your life look like if you're not able to make this happen in the next 90 days? Yeah, so... Um, my biggest thing is to have the flexibility if I want that as I kind of grow up, start a family. Um, I don't want to get to the point of wanting a family and wishing I had more time for that. I love what I do, but um, physically I don't want to be struggling to kind of get up out of bed when in 20 years because my knees are gone or something like that. But I want to do what I am doing as long as I can because I do enjoy it, but I do want the freedom um, when I might need it if something unforeseen happens or Um, wanting to focus on family stuff. Brandon, that's definitely a great why. And we're super excited and happy to help you. Uh, And just, you know, make sure you go through that homework Um, until the next time we touch base. It's so easy. And some people may be thinking like, oh, that's so obvious of a thing to do. But how many people actually sit down and do it? That's the hard part is sitting down and actually doing it. So easy to tell somebody or to know that you have to do something, it's taking the action and actually doing it. So, um, Brandon, um, if there's maybe somebody who's kind of in the same situation as you and maybe wants to reach out to you and have some accountability, um, where would be somebody, some place that they could reach out to you or find out some more information about you? Uh, Instagram would be best. Um, it's brandon.diorio, so my full name, um, so B-R-A-N-D-O-N dot D-I-O-R-I-O. Okay. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for uh, taking the time from your lunch break. And hopefully you have a couple minutes to eat. Uh, usually Tony shoves his face, uh, you know, before any recording. So feel free next time to you bring your lunch. You can eat while you're doing you. it. It's totally fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Brandon, um, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Okay. So next up we have Lawrence Briggs from Texas. And I feel like Tony and I already know Lawrence just from Instagram. We see him all over the place. Um, but Lawrence has professional property management experience and has been investing in single families near large military bases. Uh, Lawrence currently owns two long-term rental properties, but he's looking to take his business to the next level and secure creative financing. Lawrence, welcome so much to to be our mentee for this quarter one. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. This is like um, an epic opportunity. (laughs) Well, we're very excited to learn about, um, you know, where we can help you with. So why don't you start off with maybe telling us a little bit about your current investments that you have? Of course. Uh, So I have two long-term rentals. I actually purchased two rental properties within six months of each other uh, this year in 2022. I did 
both of the properties off market. So I was able to source the deal, put the deal together and um, now lease them and self-manage. So right now, um, leading up into 2023, um, my Q1 goal can go either way. Um, I'm very close to becoming 100% consumer debt free. However, if I can land another property by Q1 of 2023, I'd rather purchase another property and let the cash flow pay down that little bit of consumer debt that I have. Right now, I'm a W-2 employee like most people. So um, I have a extremely low DTI, but I've been looking at possible properties that are um, a little bit above what I would normally get approved for, um, especially if I want to get into maybe a duplex. So my goal is to be able to learn how to strategize and use creative financing to my advantage because I'm not afraid to go out there and find a deal and put it together. I just need to make sure I'm putting together the right deal that's going to become beneficial uh, for me and the seller. So so possibly um, either a DSC loan type thing or a seller finance for the next deal. So Lawrence, I mean, first congratulations on knocking out those those first two deals and doing them in such a, a short period of time. I think so many of our listeners are looking to be in that same situation, right? So you, you've already kind of set a foundation there. Thank you. So when you talk about your goals, it really is kind of adding to that portfolio, but really focusing on, like you said, either um, some kind of DSCR based loan, maybe some subject to or seller finance type deal. But what type of property are you looking for? Are you looking for a single family residence, large multifamily, small multifamily? What, is, what does that property type look like? Of course. Uh, so my ultimate um, buy box are single family homes just because I am close to a military base. And so it's very advantageous uh, for uh, single family homes um, to be available in this area. Um, and then my secondary buy box would be um, either a duplex or a fourplex. But again, that would be contingent on if I can put together a stellar win-win seller finance deal or a DSCR uh, type deal. So Lawrence, when you think about the the steps you need to take to get from where you are today to getting that that first kind of creatively finance deal in place, what does that roadmap look like to you? Uh, definitely, um, I need to learn how to be able to um, analyze those properties to make them work for seller finance. So that's kind of like my biggest hurdle that I would um, definitely be uh, very appreciative for you all to help me in that area um, to be able to look at deals and say, okay, would this work for DSCR and or seller financing or possibly subject to? So that's like my ultimate goal of learning how to analyze those those properties because we all know as a of 2022 going into 2023, there are some roadblocks when it comes to like interest rates with traditional uh, financing. Yeah, I think one way we'll be able to help you, Lawrence, is to submit multiple offers. So looking at a deal and saying, okay, what number price point would this work at with seller financing? What would this look like with doing a bank loan? What would this look like if we can you know, do subject to on it. And Lawrence, do you want to just explain to everyone what subject to is? Because we don't hear that a ton, but we did recently do an interview with uh, Pace Morby uh, as a rookie reply. So if you guys want to go back and listen to that more, um, but Lawrence, you want to just kind of describe it real quick what it is? Yeah. Uh, so I've never uh, did a subject to loan, but what most people do is what they're going to do is they're going to take over um, pretty much an existing loan. And that can be advantageous in this area because it's a military town. So what ended up happening, what happens is that we have um, our soldier members buy properties with like VA loans and then they'll get to deploy or leave the area. And so now they're stuck with these properties and they don't have a background in uh, real estate investing. So it can be very advantageous for them to be able to come in and, and do a possible subject to where you pretty much take over uh, that loan. Yeah. So that episode two with Pace Morby for anyone that wants to learn more about subject two is uh, episode 236. And Lawrence, you, you said one of your challenges was analyzing these deals using creative financing, but you you analyze those first two deals that you purchase on your own? Yes, yes. So um I I'm a I'm a huge uh, nerd when it comes to like Excel. Mm. So I kind of have um my Excel sheet and I run the numbers of, you know, 
what I would ask for, um, what I'm, what I would be approved for. And then I run about five different scenarios of different interest rates and down payments. And if it gives me that, um, that sweet spot, then I, I will just go ahead on and do the deal. And I don't like to a la carte deals. I like to holistically look at a deal. So, you know, some people are like, Oh, I have to have a 15% cash on cash return. If not, I'm going to leave it. And not, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to a la carte a real estate deal. I'm going to look at it, you know, overall, because for me, um, I'm single with no kids. So I'm in the long haul, like I'm investing for a generation of wealth to kind of change my, my, the trajectory of my family. So but I may, you know, I may fall short of that cash on cash return, but guess what? You know, I may be able to get that appreciation. You know, my primary residence that I purchased four years ago, pretty much doubled in value when people were saying not to buy in 2018. So I I don't like to just say, okay, it has to hit this particular item or I'm done with it. I want to dig into that, that idea of building generational wealth. Something we talk about often, right? But it sounds like it's a strong why for you. But before I do, I just want to point out something. You, you talked about how you analyzed those first few properties that you purchased. You talked about, uh, you know, the different Excel models, analyzing them using different interest rates and down payments. That process can be applied to the creative financing route as well. So just because the type of debt that you're using is the seller instead of the bank, it doesn't mean that your analysis of that deal changes, right? Because even when you go seller financed, um, there's still going to be some, maybe some percent of money that you're putting down. There's still going to be an interest rate. There's still going to be an amortization period. There's still going to be a term for that debt. So even though those numbers may vary from seller finance to a, to a bank loan, the analysis steps are still pretty much the same. And based on what you just described, it sounds like you're pretty good at analyzing deals already. So I, I don't know if the analysis piece is really as big of a challenge for you as you originally thought it would be. Yeah, it's definitely. um, And that's why it's good to have mentors, because, you know, if you're just kind of talking to yourself, you don't realize that, oh, you're already doing something. Um, And, and, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that it's a win win. Whenever I did put together my previous deals, it was a win win for me and the seller. Um, But just kind of, you know, learning as though. How would it work? Because, you know, some deals, they may want a balloon payment or, you know, how would it look if I would need to refinance it? You know, being able to kind of put that extra layer on kind of what I'm already good at with analyzing. And Lawrence, the deals that you're getting that you're analyzing, how are you sourcing them? Oh, network. I'm a huge networker. So um, I carry around business cards. Um, People recognize me from my bow tie around town. Um, and I just tell people like, Hey, I'm a real estate investor. Um, I'm looking for properties, um, kind of like reach out to me. I'm active on social media, if you all are aware. And so, um, the, the two ways that I found those properties, one was through, uh, doing food deliveries. I, I stopped and I thought the contractor was the owner and I'm like, Hey, like, um, is this your home? He's like, no, but I'll give you the owner's contact information. And I'm like, Oh, great. And I purchased that property. And then the second property was through, um, a Facebook group. A guy posted and was like, Hey, I'm trying to sell a property. And I'm like, okay, let's, let me run the numbers. So I definitely feel as though, um, you know, people like to say cliche, like your network, you know, is your network, but that's really true. It's not, it's not what you know, but who, you know, real quick, what are some ways that you're like, besides, okay. So you're looking through Facebook groups, your stopping places. What are some other ways that you're sourcing deals besides just you know, telling anyone and everyone what you're doing with real estate. Are you doing any kind of mail campaign or do, I mean, I guess you're kind of doing door knocking, stopping <laughs> yeah. contractors. So I did, um, I did one mail campaign, um, and I, I did it myself. Like I handed all of the letters. Um, I think I did like maybe 50, um, because I was like, I really want them like handwritten and stuff. I think probably after like the 10th letter, I was like, I'm over it, but I gave myself a goal and I sent, <laughs> I gave myself a goal and I sent out like about 50 letters. Um, I didn't get any deals from it, but I end up connecting with the realtor who said, Hey, did you ever send a letter to one of my clients? <laughs> because I think he received the letter and he definitely doesn't want to sell, but he, he had never received a actual hand written letter. And she's like, we'll keep you in mind if, if he decides to ever sell something from his portfolio. So Lawrence, what is your why for all of this? Why are you grinding and hustling to become a real estate investor? What's, what's the purpose behind it? 
Yeah. So um, my why is to break generational um, poverty in my family. Um, So I was uh, born in the housing projects of New Orleans. Um, The Calio projects is probably one of the uh, worst housing projects um, probably in America. And I was raised by a single mother who was not lazy. She worked about three jobs, but just with a barely high school education, maybe like up to ninth grade, she had to become a jan- janitor in hospitals. And so um, what she did was um, as a single mother, she tried to help me and my sisters. I have, I'm one of seven, I have six sisters. And um, she didn't have a financial literacy background. You know, my work ethic comes from her, but she didn't know, like, you can't just get wealthy from working. And um, my why is to break that curse because I'm the only one that's mainly in my family who, um, you know, understands financial literacy and practice it. So it would be a full circle moment to be able to leave a legacy that's beyond me. Um, So like my future nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews and, um, you know, possible children wouldn't have to be born into poverty. So that's my why. Lawrence, I'm so proud of you. Like just stating, you know, that you've taken the initiative to educate yourself. And that's, you know, that's very hard to change how you've kind of known everything for your whole life to, to change and to want to, you know, take action onto something else. Um, and I think that is a, a great why. And it seems like Thank it's, you. Um, you know, definitely motivation enough for you to to keep going and to really create that generational wealth. Yeah, Lawrence, I, I love hearing, hearing the story. And I, I think it's just, it's proof that, um, you know, where you start obviously has a, a big impact on how far you can go, but it definitely doesn't cap what you're capable of. And I think my follow-up question is, what do you think it was that sparked that idea in you? Because so many people who grow up in a certain environment, it's all that they know, it's all that they're exposed to. They can't even fathom anything beyond what they see around them. So what was it in your upbringing that allowed you to see beyond that? Um, Of course. Uh, So um, like I said, my mother worked about two or three jobs and what she did was she wanted to expose our mind. And so she sent me to private schools. And so I was like one of the few kids like from the projects, like going to a private school with children whose parents were doctors and lawyers and stuff. And when I would leave this poverty area, I would go into these neighborhoods where suburbs. And I started to fall in love with like these single family homes. And my little brain kind of associated that with a better life. And we know that there's crime and criminal activity that happens anywhere. But I was like, I need to get my family there. And I never want any one of my family members to not live in um, a quote unquote safe environment. So being able to go into those neighborhoods when I was going to private school, I associated those houses as a, as a better life because that environment was completely different than the criminal, you know, gunshots and activity that I witnessed as a child. Yeah, well, kudos to your mom for having that insight to help you expand, you know, what you were seeing, because all you have to do is see it. And then immediately now it becomes something that, that's attainable, right? Um, so a, a couple of things, uh, first, uh, I love that, that you're focused on creative finance, Ash and I, that's not our, our super specialty, right? I think both of mm-hmm. us kind of dabbled in, in the seller finance, uh, space, but, um, there are a couple of episodes on some other bigger pockets shows and want you to go listen to this. This will be part of your homework. So, okay. um, on the market episode 29, um, Pace Morby's on that episode and then Bigger Pockets episode uh, 527. All right. And then for those of you that are Bigger Pockets pro members, Lawrence, I know you are, but this is more so for our rookies that are listening. If you guys are pro members, you can use uh, or you actually get access to as a pro member uh, to Envelo, which is the software that helps you find off market deals. You can send mailing mailers. You can do uh, like Legion, all kinds of great things to help you find off market deals. So Lawrence, you already got access to that before our rookies might be a good thing for you guys to check out as well. Well, Lawrence, thank you so much for sharing um, kind of the start of your journey with us. And so Tony kind of went over your homework a little bit to listen to those Pace Morby episodes. And then I'd also kind of challenge you to put together a sample offer. So even if it's just a property you see on the MLS, go ahead and actually write up what you would offer for seller financing. So how much would you put down on the property 
what would be the interest rate you would do? Um, how many years would you have it amortized over? Would there be a balloon payment? Would it be callable? So put together a sample offer and then I want you to bring it with you next time we're in a call and we're going to go over it and kind of look at it. We'll look at the numbers on the deal and we'll look at how you set up the, the seller financing on it and what number actually makes sense to purchase the property at. Awesome. That sounds great. I'm ready to get to work. And Lawrence, what is your Instagram if anybody wants to connect with you? Yes. So my Instagram is Lawrence, common spelling, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E underscore Briggs, B-R-I-G-G-S. You can't miss me. I have a big smile and a bow tie. Lawrence, thank you so much. And we cannot wait to spend the next 90 days with you and provide as much value as we can to help you continue your investing journey. Me too. Woo! <laughs> Melanie, welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. You're our third and final mentee for this episode, and we are super excited to share your story with our audience here and kind of get into what's going on over the next 90 days. Quick background on, on you, Melanie. You've already got two properties in Colorado, which is amazing. Uh, you spent the last month in Florida looking at some short-term rentals out there, so I'm excited to dive into that. Um, you already have your real estate license, which is great, and uh, the long-term goals for you are stepping away from that W-2 and uh, spending part of the year in somewhere that's a little bit warmer than a in Colorado. So uh, excited to have you on the podcast, Melanie. Welcome. Welcome to the Minty Group. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I uh, couldn't have introed myself any better. And um, yeah, really, really excited to be part of this cohort. Um, Lawrence and Brandon are uh, wonderful. We've been kind of chatting offline. So just very grateful for the opportunity. Exciting. So I know you're, you're looking at short-term rentals, but um, how has that journey been for you so far? Because you already have the two long, two long terms in Colorado, right? And this will be your first short term. One's actually a midterm, uh, part of our primary residence. And we kind of stumbled into it. It was meant to be long-term, but yes, uh, this would be uh, the short-term venture. So what are some of those challenges you feel like you're running up against as you uh, step into this this world of short-term rentals? Yeah. So I guess to give you some background, um, I you know went to BPCon and sat in on Amanda Hahn's session about uh, tax strategies and basically learned about cost segregation uh, studies and you know specifically the benefits of being a W-2 employee um, and having a, an STR. So I left BPCon and just said, okay, I've got to buy an STR before the, the year is over. And, you know, I am a native in Colorado, but I couldn't hate being cold any more than I possibly do. And so I thought, you know, I, I uh, Florida is probably the place we have family there. Um, and I am just going to be committed to that process. So I found an agent off the, the BP forums and He's been phenomenal. Um, we've been talking a lot about what what I was interested in, kind of my budget. Um, and, you know, pretty quickly off the bat, I, I realized I was feeling a little in over my head. Um, my W-2 is in the tech industry. And when I started the process and thinking about it, I felt like I just had more risk tolerance in general. Uh, and I'm starting to feel like I have just a little bit less. And so thinking about buying, you know, $400,000, $500,000 property with a pool that would do really well on Airbnb just became a little more nerve wracking. And so that was kind of the start of that, uh, we shifted a little bit. I changed my price range a little bit. Uh, we started looking at some other properties, um, but kind of my current my current challenge there is, you know, I've been looking at a number of them. I saw a few in person. Um, the average daily rate is just not in in some of my analyses, just not panning out to really show any profit. And in many cases, it's quite negative. Um, and I think that makes sense for my price point and kind of just you know, looking at some of the properties a little further off the coast. But I, what I would say is my biggest challenge is, do I really need to reconsider this move for the current uh, time that we're in? You know, I'm, I'm looking at um, occupancy on Airbnb properties all over Florida and just seeing much lower occupancy that I would expect and what I would, what I've heard to be peak seasons. And so thinking about viability, you know, considering the state of the economy, economic headwinds and everything. I just want to be smart about this goal because ultimately the idea is to have a cash flowing property. 
Um, and I can, I can wait to escape winter <laughs> for a few more years uh, before I will just jump into a forced deal. Well, I appreciate all that background, Melanie, and uh, I know a few follow-up questions from from me here. So what what would you say is more important to you? Is it getting a property in Florida or is it getting a getting the right property anywhere? Great question. It is getting a cash flowing property. Uh, the broader goal is becoming financially independent and finding cash flowing properties. And so I would easily sacrifice finding a property in any specific area if i could locate one that would that would add to a portfolio my portfolio and um, start to help generate real profit so one one additional question have you looked at any other markets outside of florida yeah i i follow the short-term shop i really love avery's podcast um i know some of the areas that they're active in um i think my you know i haven't done any analysis there but I looked at besides the area I was in in Tampa, some of the other Florida markets that they were looking in. Um, I know they're in the Blue Ridge Mountains, some areas in Georgia, Mississippi as well. I'm open to those. I, I think one thing I kind of wanted to run by you all is, you know, it's it's an investment, right? I want to make sure that I'm not getting spooked too early and I'm not, you know, giving up too early. Of course, the goal is find a property in the next 90 days, but um, the short answer is I'm open to considering other markets if, if, you know, it comes to the point where I just need to like reconsider my, my previous decision. So obviously Tony is going to be way more value at kind of understanding the short-term rental industry than I am. But one common occurrence I've seen from guests that we've had recently is that you want to look at where there's big attractions, where people are always going to be visiting. So we just had somebody on that talked about national parks is how they don't ever see people stop visiting national parks. So Tony, I'm interested to hear also what you think of that as to sticking in markets where there is that large attraction where people are always going to consistently visit And then Melanie, if you could kind of follow up as to the markets in Florida that you're looking at, do they have some kind of big draw that's maybe just more than warm weather in the beach? Yeah, I I think, I mean, obviously both markets that we're super active in right now are centered around national parks. We're in Tennessee near the Smoky Mountains. We're in Joshua Tree near um, uh, the Joshua Tree National Park. Um, So I I do have a a big love for the national park scene as well. Um, Well, here, here's kind of my, my advice, Melanie, and I'll let you answer Ash's question as well. But I do think that a lot of the more mature vacation rental markets, uh, we've seen massive price increases over the last two years, but the uh, average daily rates in those markets have not kept pace with those um, price increases, right? So a cabin in Tennessee might be worth 75% more in 2022 than it was in 2019, but the ADRs haven't increased by 75% to offset that difference. So you are seeing profits in some of these bigger, more mature markets getting squeezed a little bit, which is why I asked the question around like market selection. I think for newer investors, um, going into some of these more secondary and tertiary markets where there is demand, like something like a national park or some other kind of driver, but they're not as popular as the Smoky Mountains where there's you know 10,000 listings in that general, general region. Um, so I'll, I'll let you answer Ashley's question about kind of what the other draws are to Florida. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest with you, Ashley, um, you know, kind of what I did instead of so so no i wasn't looking for other hot spots i know that that is really vital advice that i've heard on a lot of podcasts making sure you're by hospitals or other tourist locations um my biggest consideration was just the ocean and personal preference at first so i definitely have uh room to dig into that further i was kind of picking areas based on also like my second factor as i was kind of taking a step back was to look at some analysis uh platforms so str insights was one i was looking at quite a bit and um basically long story short i was just thinking oh the prices are much lower in this particular area uh, perhaps there's just a higher uh like there's going to be a higher margin here because you're putting down less um, but then I did, you know, a little more digging on the bigger pockets forum and 
a lot of the feedback I got was that there's there aren't draws to this area and just these analyses, these um, basically looking at data from specific locations isn't enough. So uh, it's a factor I really need to take into consideration now if I continue with with finding a short term rental for sure. Yeah. I mean, my short-term rentals are all in very rural areas where, you know, the attraction is, you know, a a very small hospital or people just come and stay because there's only one hotel in the town. So there's literally nothing else, but also I'm doing Airbnb arbitrage where there's very little risk. I'm not, you know, dumping $400,000 into a property. Um, the ones that I do own are 50 to a hundred thousand dollar properties. So it's not, if they're not these huge investments that, you know, if for some reason people aren't coming there anymore, it's not, you know, that big of a deal that I, I can cover the cost of it for a while. But with with doing you had said that you're getting the negative cash flow when you're doing the deal analysis. How many offers have you submitted? I have not submitted any offers. Okay. Yeah. So here's what I want to challenge you for your homework is to put in some lowball offers. So at the purchase price, you're getting negative cash flow. So what would the purchase price need to be and what would the terms of the loan need to be to make it cash flow and then just start throwing out an offer? Even if you just do one offer between now and the time we talk, just throwing it out at you know that low price. Um, another thing you can do too is if it's already an existing short-term rental is asking for 2019 data. So we analyze campgrounds, me and my partner. And that's one thing that any, every campground operator we've talked to has said is don't use data just from 2020 and 2021. And now 2022, let's go back to 2019 and pull data from there too, to see before, you know, traveling exploded for those couple of years and see what it was like then. So see if you can get any of that data and then even going back to and on, Tony on Air DNA, can you go back and look at data for like markets to see what the daily rate was in 2019? I mean, obviously it's not going to be the same, but you could see, look at what the occupancy is. Yeah, you know, usually the data I look at it, it only goes back I think 18 months. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that software goes back to 2019 or not. Okay, well, Melanie, um, we would love for you to submit an offer. Um, even more than one better, but just make the pr- make it at the price point your offer, and don't be afraid to you know insult someone or to put in that that low offer. Plus, it's you know it's super exciting and so worth it if it gets accepted, or even if they counter at you, you can see like okay, maybe there is another way to make this work. If you know we can kind of talk about that if that does happen, but. I think it's time you're ready to to put in an offer at whatever that price point is. That makes sense. Thanks, Ashley. I, I love that recommendation. Yeah, my, my second piece of uh, advice for you, I, I guess the, the homework here would be to choose at least two other markets. Okay, Florida is, is a very big popular market with uh, lots of uh, competition, uh, regardless of kind of where we're at in the cycle. People are always kind of going to Florida and just a very popular uh, travel destination. So I want you to try and find at least two other markets that are maybe mid-size markets, um, somewhere where there's, you know, a hundred to 500 listings in those markets. So it, there's still a decent draw there, but the competition is, is definitely softer in terms of how many people were submitting offers and the price points will probably be, um, a little bit smaller as well. And when you look into these markets, um, there are really three things you want to be looking for. And this applies not just to you, Melanie, but to all of our listeners as well. Um, first, you want to look at the policies. You want to understand what the short-term rental permits are for for that city, for that county. Um, typically, the county website or calling up there, you can get that information pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and the second is popularity, right? You don't want to go too small. If there's anything less than like 100 listings, I probably wouldn't touch that market. Um, I want to see at least some active short-term rentals already just for proof of concept. Uh, I don't know if I want to be the 10th listing in any given city, because it might mean that who knows if people are going to show up or not. Um, and the third thing is just the profitability, right? You want to make sure that after you check those first two boxes, that you're still able to find deals that, that meet your return. When you're actually looking at the properties themselves, you want to look at location. 
Okay. Every kind of city has a hot spot where listings tend to do a little bit better. And through your analysis, you'll start to see where those better performing properties are. Um, you want to look at amenities. Okay. Like what are the top amenities in that market? And does this property have those amenities or do I have the ability to add those amenities? Um, and the third is like the value, right? Like am I same as like profitability, right? Are you going to get the return you want after factoring all those things? So I know that's a mouthful. Go back, re-listen to what I just said right now. But I think if you tackle those few things, you'll be in a much better uh, better position when we talk next time. Thanks for that. I have one follow-up question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you know, thinking about the year ahead, are you in calculations or just as you advise people, are you considering lower occupancy? Are you trying to factor that in just knowing that things are shifting in general? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think you you probably want to add a little bit of buffer um, to any ADR or occupancy calculations that you're doing. Um, how much is, is really hard to say because no one really has that crystal ball. Um, but I think adding some kind of, you know, maybe a negative 10% on your ADRs or 15% if you want to be super conservative is, is realistic. But just know like every dollar change in an ADR has a pretty big impact on your, your revenue at the end of the year. So somewhere around 10% might be pretty good. But just you know, like even every recession going back to like the, the 60s, right? Most of them lasted just under on average, just under 12 months, right? So it's like, can you buy this property? And even if it maybe isn't a, a home run over those first 12 months, while all, there's all this economic uncertainty, what happens in year two and in year five and in year 10 as you own the short-term rental? And if you kind of check those boxes that we talked about, where you're hitting the, the location, you're hitting the value, you're hitting the amenities, more likely than not, that listing is going to continue to do well. So there will probably be some uncertainty in the short term, but I think as real estate investors, we have to roll with those punches. Um, and remember that we're really investing for that long-term appreciation and cash flow as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great uh, reminder. And Melanie, before we end today's call, what is your why for real estate investing? I, you know, I I really love my W two. I'm fortunate to have uh, a wonderful team and and be able to do what I do. At the same time, I just don't want to sit behind my computer for the rest of my life. I really want to be able to. Uh, build some of that freedom into my life. And so financial independence is the ultimate why. Um, it helps that real estate is so fun and challenging and exciting and interesting. Um, and so I'm just very motivated to continue learning and growing. I think, you know, I, I also uh, have pursued getting my license on the side just because I really do evaluate or do enjoy evaluating deals. And so I hope that that continues to be part of my career, but a little bit more flexible as uh, time progresses. Well, Melanie, thank you so much for joining us for the next 90 days. We're super excited. And where can someone reach out to you if they want to connect with you? <laughs> I hate to sound just so dry, but I would uh, ref, uh, I would encourage you to go to LinkedIn. I'm not very active on Instagram. I feel like I'm like always on LinkedIn. So just my name, Melanie Wilmisher, um, and super responsive there. <laughs> That's probably got to be the saddest place for people to reach out <laughs> to you that you've ever heard. <laughs> One of my best friends, Lika, she is like a LinkedIn queen and she nags on me all the time because I'm not at LinkedIn and she has sourced so many deals from there, let private money lenders from there and investors to work with. Like she has had huge success with it. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Melanie. So Tony, we have just met our three mentees and went over their goals and gave them their first homework assignment. So what are your thoughts? You know, I, I think some of the, the the things I'm seeing across all three of them is that, you know, the the challenges that they thought were challenges weren't as big as what they really were. And when you take some time to kind of unravel those, you you understand that the steps you need to take are a little bit more clear than what they initially anticipated. So and honestly, I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of new investors run into is like they there's this emotional aspect that makes things a little bit scarier than they really are. But when you take stock of all of the things you already know and things you understand, it is a little bit easier to move forward than you give yourself credit for. 
And I think like this can relate to me and you too, Tony, is sometimes we know what we need to do. It just takes somebody else to tell us to do that. That's why I love having a trainer in the gym because it's like, I know I should be doing this, but like when they're in your face saying like, do it one more time, like then it, it, you know, it keeps you motivated. So hopefully we can have that same impact on our mentees here as well. And for all the rookies at home, we would love for you guys to set your own 90 day goals. And if you don't know what your why is yet, Really um, try to define that and give you something that's going to give you the motivation and really energize you every single day to keep pushing forward to actually reach that goal. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And we will be back with another episode. See you guys next time. Still-